welcome to Daily Debrief brought to you by People's Dispatch. I am Shriya. In the United Kingdom, the illegal migration bill that was introduced by the Rishi Sunak government this week has stirred up widespread criticism from all corners for undermining fundamental human rights. In Sri Lanka, meanwhile, activists and medical workers from the South Asian country's health sector staged demonstrations on March 8 to call attention to the impact of the year-long economic crisis on the health of its population and the country's flailing health sector. And finally, we also talk about the South Korean government's appealing a district court's landmark ruling that had ordered compensation to a victim of atrocities committed by the country's armed forces during the war in Vietnam. On March 8, the UNHCR condemned UK's new illegal migration bill that was tabled in the House of Commons early this week. Calling it a clear breach of the 1951 Refugee Convention, the UN Refugee Agency has urged the MPs to reconsider the bill. If adopted, the new bill would deny the right to seek refugee protection to people arriving irregularly in the United Kingdom, such as those risking their lives to cross the English Channel in, a small, in small boats. Instead, these asylum seekers would face detention and deportation without having their individual circumstances examined. We're joined by Anish from People's Dispatch with latest updates on this story. Welcome to this episode, Anish. Glad to have you back. So, in UK, can you take us through the main provisions of this bill that is being criticised so far and wide, uh, just to, you know, get an a sense of what is the uh, bill really about? Yeah, so, uh, at the, uh, like, I'll just run through some of the main, like, features of the bill. Uh, we have to talk about how it deals with undocumented immigrants. Uh, to begin with, it gives them a certain uh, set of criminality. It assigns a criminality to immigrants in general if they do not, uh, if they are undocumented. Now, the word, the very word uh, being illegal uh, uh, of people who arrive in the UK illegally, it's just that in most cases, many of them, as like the way we have talked about in the United States, in most cases, it's not necessarily people who have willfully arrived uh, into the UK or are in the UK uh, illegally, so to speak, but are just undocumented or do not, did not have their papers right at the right time. Uh, in several other cases, you have people who get trafficked and obviously uh, the center of the, uh, the entire bill, the refugees themselves. So in most of these cases, uh, documentation is not an easy process. Uh, going through uh, quote-unquote proper channels is also not uh, uh, you know, the first option for most of them. So in many of these cases, what they uh, stand behind a certain uh, certain protections that are given to them, which does not give them like defaulted uh, criminality. Uh, and these provisions are being taken out. These are like basic human rights provisions that anybody should be having, whether or not they have come into a country illegally or legally or whatever. Uh, it's just certain basic provisions where they are given certain benefits of doubt. Uh, they are given, uh, you know, certain human rights to uh, to be able to appeal to courts, go to courts. Uh, but these are some of the things that uh, the new bill seeks to remove from uh, people who uh, from undocumented immigrants. Uh, most of the cases, it's basically uh, provisions to send them back to the home country. Whether on, uh, you know, in, there there is definitely a safe conditions clause. Basically, they will send them to a third safe country. But in main, most cases, it's just basically uh, deportation that is at the heart of the bill. And obviously, uh, there are some very contentious uh, prob, uh, issues with the bill because it basically attacks refugees. It basically attacks uh, people who have been trafficked into the UK. And they will not be getting any of the protections that uh, the U British law currently provides them to be able to not only uh, seek asylum, but also to, uh, you know, fight back against or, uh, you know, access justice against those who have trafficked them to the country, those who have put them in uh, dire and dangerous situations. This is something that will be denied after this bill. Right. Anish, one more thing you referred to how the essence of this of the criticisms that are coming along for the for this bill and this aligns with also what UNHCR highlighted is a violation of the 1951 refugee convention so that's really refugee rights are they stand to be violated uh, can you tell us a little more about this yeah so uh, the refugee convention essentially 
uh, gives refugees is uh, was created with an intention to give refugees a chance uh, to not only seek safe asylum uh, but also to uh, you know uh, to have protections for them against any kind of unwarranted uh, harassment or state persecution in the country they that they have found themselves in because of the conditions back home. Now, uh, we are also looking at, there is one certain uh, aspect of this, which is, uh, uh, which is that the bill will take out any kind of modern slavery um, uh, claims that a refugee or somebody who has been trafficked into the UK. And in many of the cases, people, uh, when we see Rishi Sunak standing in front of billboards and uh, banners that say, send the boats back, uh, it, uh, the people who come by boats are basically people who are, by many de several definitions, can be called as trafficked because they have been, uh, you know, uh, duped into thinking that they are uh, gaining safe asylum in a country which does not want them, and they end up being in situations that are dangerous, that can, you know, uh, that that are harmful to them in general. And so in such a condition, it's uh, these refugees, these uh, people who have been trafficked that needs protection. But instead of that, uh, this will be taken away from them. The UNHRC uh, has come out very strongly against it. You already have people in Britain coming out very strongly, some even calling it uh, comparable to Nazi Germany's policies on uh, immigration. And which is quite, uh, you know, comparable considering the fact that it does not want to uh, consider uh, any kind of uh, human rights protections for uh, people who come from outside the United Kingdom unless they go through certain very rigid standards that the British government is right now keen on prescribing. So, which essentially goes against any kind of spirit of uh, you know, giving or affording anybody who are in need uh, protections or asylum, safe asylum. And that is what uh, the criticisms are centering around. Obviously, you have the wider anti-immigration uh, sentiments being whipped up by the Tory government at a time when uh, the Suna government is unable to, uh, you know, deliver a lot of promises that he came to power with, uh, not being able to, uh, you know, restrain the economic, the spiraling economic crisis within the United Kingdom, or uh, to deal with the, uh, you know, the union protests that are happening right now. But uh, this sort of, you know, anti-immigration sentiments often becomes like a mask for all of these incompetencies of his government. So that is also a part of the debate. But at the center of it is real human rights questions of people who are victims of the circumstances, uh, of very dire circumstances, uh, should I add. And that is what the British government right now is trying to take away. Thank you so much for joining us, Anish. We'll be back with you soon for another story. We go to South Asia now, where in the island nation of Sri Lanka, an economic crisis has carried on for nearly an year, leading to severe shortages of food, fuel and medicine. Sri Lanka's massive drugs shortage had peaked last year, pushing its largely state-funded sector to the brink of collapse. Although there is some relief, but the crisis continues to impact the marginalized sections of Sri Lankan society, especially its women and children, who battle deteriorating reproductive and sexual health, as well as malnutrition. We're joined by Sirimal Paris of People's Health Movement Sri Lanka for more updates on this issue. Welcome to this episode, sir. And very glad to have you. The first question is about uh, the protest yesterday. Uh, what were the, some of the demands that were raised yesterday at the protest? And what were the concerns that the protesters and the health workers, they were raising? Uh, yesterday protest we organized with our network. Uh, that means uh, including uh, political parties, uh, NGOs, trade unions, and uh, well wishers. So we demand uh, especially for needs for mothers. That means uh, mothers are suffering a lot of this crisis. So we demand uh, food. We demand uh, stationery for children. And uh, we demand uh, food for lactating mothers and pregnant mothers. And especially, we uh, emphasize 
within this crisis vastly uh, effect for the women so uh, this government must concern about women first then we can solve this problem otherwise uh, government can tell various things to the people but women and children are suffering from they can't this is enough for them so we government should give some type of relief for women and children so those are our demands yesterday right and uh, one more thing uh, what has can you also paint us a larger picture of what has been the situation of the he uh, health sector uh, in one year of the economic crisis uh, first i would like to uh, give some scenario about health situation in sri lanka nearly 5 mil uh, 5 million sri lankan including 200000 in kalambua live in hand to mouth eating less selling their gold jewelry and borrowing money uh, among those at risk are 56000 children under 5 years with severe acute malnutrition and need nutrition rich food uh, the un says up to 22% of the population needs food day it says 86% of homes are reducing what they eat and some are going without meals so this is the situation of uh, uh, health situation of sri lanka at present yes and uh, the implications that coming of imf into the island can have on the health sector because the health sector is largely state funded it covers a wide base of the population what are some of the effects it will have on the marginalized sections of the uh, sri lankan population present situation is actually free health system is not functioning doctors are going abroad uh, health sector other professionals are trying to go abroad and find some jobs so this situation there are lack, not only drugs lack of shortage of uh, shortage of health personnel so uh, actually our hospitals now they are they can uh, examine uh, patients and they are given prescription to buy drugs from outside but sometimes pharmacists also have shortage of drugs this is the present situation very worst time in sri lanka all right thank you so much for joining us today uh, it's been great talking to you and it's great to have you with us on the show thank you so much mr peris for joining us thank you On March 8, the Defence Ministry of the Republic of Korea announced that the government has appealed a court order to compensate a Vietnamese victim of atrocities committed by South Korean troops who had fought alongside US forces during the Vietnam War. The district court's order, which came in February, rewarded compensation worth 30 million won, which is being seen as a historic move and a first legal acknowledgement of South Korea's role in the war in Vietnam. Anish is back with us with the latest update on this story. So Anish first questions first what is this case really about and what are the latest updates? So yeah so uh, this case was first filed in 2020 uh, pretty much 2 years after a group of civil society movements in South Korea created the People's Tribunal uh, for atrocities uh, on uh, at least atrocities committed by South Korean troops in Vietnam. uh so in this case specifically we have uh the appellant which is when uh, titan she uh was one of the survivors of a massacre that was allegedly committed allegedly i say that uh with a pinch of salt but in this case uh, the, it was proven in the court uh committed by south korean troops in 1968 in central vietnam uh which killed about 70 uh uh and that uh, and she has been uh, offered uh, compensation by the uh, the Co uh, south korean court in uh, seoul which is a district court uh, so it's a lower court obviously but still uh, it definitely uh, acknowledged both the atrocities committed by 
uh, the South Korean uh, forces in Vietnam at the time, and also how uh, uh, South Korea is liable to pay for the atrocities that it has committed there. So we are talking about, so this is the first such case, uh, and it is also the first such case where, as you pointed out, a very, uh, you know, a legal or a judicial uh, recognition has happened of the atrocities. Obviously, it is not the first time that South Koreans um, are made aware of the atrocities that their country uh, or their soldiers committed in Vietnam during the war. Uh, in at a, it was pretty much well known, at least since the 1990s, right after uh, the military dictatorship was overthrown, and there were talks about uh, you know the government's uh, you know the government's own uh, massacres committed within South Korea. So there was also talks about uh, parallelly about uh, South Korea's involvement in the atrocities that allied allied forces or pro U.S. forces committed in uh, Vietnam. And obviously, uh, this opens up a whole new uh, opportunity. Uh, well, opportunity is not the right word, but a whole new avenue for uh, victims of uh, the of various atrocities. Talking about uh, what, from very conservative estimates, hundreds or maybe even more than a thousand people killed, and more than that, uh, the level of atrocities, which includes le uh, you know leveling of entire villages. Uh, you know, uh, holding people captive, sexual assault, and so on, uh, being committed on, uh, you know, Vietnamese people, most of them uh, civilian uh, by South Korean forces, uh, with or without uh, the association of the United States. So in such cases, there are there is now a whole new avenue being opened up where compensation claims, while uh, South Korea is already dealing with compensation claims of Japanese atrocities or, on, on Koreans, we are now also seeing a parallel movement for South Koreans to uh, reckon with the, their own atrocities that they have committed on, a Vietnam, on Vietnamese people. Right. And on that note, Anish, can you also take us through the history of South Korea's involvement in the war in Vietnam? Yeah, so South Korea was, after the United States, it was the largest force uh, present in uh, Vietnam during the war. It had more than 300,000 troops, active troops uh, at, the, at its peak. And uh, in many cases, the U.S. Uh, forces pretty much outsourced a lot of military operation. It was pretty much like an outsourced uh, set of operations because the U.S. was paying the South Korean government and its troops uh, in uh, wages and uh, you know amounts that were far cheaper than what it would have been to deploy U.S. forces uh, to the ground. So it was pretty much an outsourced sort of uh, you know force mobilization uh, that South Korea had benefited from. Uh, in fact, uh, the South Korea's presence in Vietnam benefited not only. Uh, the government at the time, which secured, uh, you know, extensive U.S. military and economic support uh, in many ways, uh, but also generous contracts, uh, military contracts even, uh, that helped many of its corporations to boom uh, by the late 70s. And that pretty much, uh, you know, is part of the reason why uh, uh, what explains the kind of prosperity that South Korea saw in the 80s and 90s. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, this presence obviously came with it uh, a certain level of ruthlessness because we have to remember it was not a no democratic government in South Korea that was deploying uh, these forces. It was a military dictatorship and it uh, pretty much served the purpose of not only uh, legitimizing the military dictatorship uh, with the Western powers or pro-Western powers in the region, but also supported it uh, against uh, internal resistance. And that pretty much kept the dictatorship in power, both in South Korea and also at the same time encouraged in many ways the Korean troops to you know, be unhinged in many ways. There were in fact uh, reports where uh, the, Amer the US uh, commanders were actually complaining uh, about South Korean troops being ruthless and more ruthless or committing atrocities, which is how dire the situation was in many instances. So this is a sort of baggage that South Korea had with its pres military presence in Vietnam. And after the, after the end of the war, 
much of this atrocities, much of that uh, baggage was never reckoned with until and after the democratic revolution. And after which uh, we have seen successive uh, conservative governments, including the current one, uh, you know, just brushing it aside most of the times or oppo opposing any claims. But we have seen several times in the past where uh, South Koreans were forced to uh, reckon with certain individual atrocities committed by individual commanders of their forces. But there was no overall attempt uh, or there was no, uh, you know, national attempt, nationwide attempt to actually uh, investigate the level of these atrocities on the ground. We still do not know the actual numbers of the people killed by South Korean uh, forces or the level of damage that they committed. But obviously, uh, the current case and however it, uh, you know, unravels with the appeals court and higher courts in the future, we still have the debate now becoming a national debate and part of the compensations debate that is already raging with Koreans against Japan, but also now with Vietnamese vis-a-vis uh, -vis South Koreans. Rightly said, Anish, it is a move in the right direction, hopefully. Uh, with that, thank you so much for joining us today. And that's all we have for today. For more such stories, please visit peoplesdispatch.org. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram.